Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're taking a look today at another Chromebook tablet. This is the HP Chromebook X211. It has a detachable keyboard and pen, and it looks a lot like a Microsoft Surface device, but it is running Chrome OS, and we're going to take a closer look at what this tablet is all about in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this is on loan from HP. So we're done with this, it goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this Chromebook is all about. Now the price point as configured is $599. The price will vary based on the bundle that you pick for it. So you can buy it without the pen, for example, and pay a little bit less money. Uh, but this one came with the keyboard, the pen, and the rear kickstand, and of course, the tablet itself. It's got a very nice display. It's 11 inches. It's running at 2160 by 1440, which is a 2K display. And it's very bright at 400 nits. And I really like that it's got a three by two aspect ratio which makes it really nice for browsing the web and working on documents, especially when you're in this laptop configuration. Now, when you've got all the accessory items attached here, this weighs about two pounds, five ounces, or just over a kilogram. When you detach everything, the tablet itself weighs about one pound, four ounces, or 567 grams. It is all metal here. It really feels very nice and solid. It is a little thicker perhaps than some iPads and other tablets out there, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It's got a good amount of rigidity, but it's not that heavy. And it feels very nice to hold this in your hand as you write on it. So it does well as a tablet, and I think it does pretty well in a surface kind of configuration when you've got the keyboard attached to it. Uh, this rear plate is the kickstand, and what you do here is just align it up with its magnets. It'll basically put itself into place here. The keyboard will also align itself with magnets and reattach to the unit, and then you can drop the kickstand and use it like a laptop. I found that it actually works pretty well on the lap. These things are always kind of a hit or miss, uh, but this one, at least for my legs, I'm able to use it relatively comfortably. You do, though, need some length on your legs because you do have to account for not only the screen, but the rear kickstand here. So a laptop is going to take up less real estate on your lap versus something that has this surface-like design. Now inside, this is powered by an ARM processor. It's got a Qualcomm Snapdragon 7C first generation processor. There is a second generation of that 7C chip that we saw running on a Samsung Windows laptop recently. So this will perform a little slower than that Samsung laptop did. But I think for Chrome OS, this is a good pairing of a processor, especially given that a lot of the other ARM-based Chromebooks are running with slower MediaTek chips. This one performs pretty well, I think, for what it is. You got a lot of RAM on this one, eight gigabytes. And you also have 64 gigabytes of storage. And the reason why the RAM is important is because these Chromebooks now run Android apps and Linux apps. And if you want all of that stuff running together at the same time, you definitely need the memory to do it. So it was nice to see an adequate amount of memory installed on this device. Now, HP says the battery life on this should be about 10 to 11 hours, and I would agree with that assessment if you stick to the basics like web browsing and email and some document writing and keep the display brightness down. If you're doing things that will tax the processor more, like Android games or some kind of crazy Linux engineering app, that, of course, will eat into your battery life more significantly. It does charge, though, via one of these two USB Type-C ports on the left-hand side of the unit. These are full service USB-C ports, so they will output video to an external monitor. Uh, you can also use data devices at the same time as well. So you could plug in a docking station, for example. One thing to note, though, is that these ports only allow one external display to be used at a time. So you can use either of these ports for an external display, but it only supports outputting to one of them at any given time. So you can have the internal display running and a secondary display, but not two. Uh, there is a volume rocker here. Above that is a SIM card tray. There is a 4G version available of this device. I don't have that one, but this door will be on all versions because you can also insert an SD card, a micro SD card, to augment its internal storage. So you can plug one of those cards in the side there, 
and it will secure itself inside of that door. You've got to use a little SIM popper to get it out. Now there are a pair of stereo speakers on this device. You've got one here and one here. So when you have it in landscape orientation, you will get decent stereo separation. The speakers are a little bit tinny, but it does have some very nice clarity to them. So I think it'll do well for video watching and uh, doing conference calls and whatnot but you might want to attach a pair of headphones for better audio quality. There's no headphone jack on this because that's out of style these days, but uh, you can of course attach a USB-C adapter to one of those ports on the side or go with Bluetooth. Uh, one other thing to note here is at the top, this power switch is a fingerprint reader. So if I turn off the unit here and then just power it on, it'll unlock uh, with my fingerprint that I programmed earlier. You can store multiple fingerprints in there, so if you have the uh, tablet in another orientation, you can use the finger from your other hand uh, to get it open. On the side here is a capacitive charger for the pen, and the pen that it comes with, at least in the bundle that I got, uh, will charge with that capacitive charger here on the side. Now the pen is a USI compatible pen, so it's a standards compliant pen. You can use any USI pen with this, but this HP pen, will charge on the side here, which might be more convenient, and it attaches with a magnet, so it'll hold itself there pretty well, and you can have it stored either up or down, uh, depending on how you attach it. Now, it's got a decent camera on the front of it here. This is a five megapixel camera. It says it can shoot up to 2592 by 1944 for video, at least that's what it's showing me on the app here but it can easily do 1080p, which is the demo shot that you see here. My only gripe with the camera is that it leaves a lot of headroom based on the angle of the tablet here. So I have to kind of hold it almost completely vertical to get myself into a good frame. So you may have to put it up on some books or something to get a better angle of the shot. It will do 30 frames per second max at all of its supported resolutions for video. It also shoots photos out of the front. Now there's a rear camera on here as well. This is an eight megapixel camera. It too can do 1080p, 30 frames per second video out of the back. The quality's not great either for video or photos. The colors are kind of washed out, but it's a camera. And if you need to take something in a pinch and you don't have something better, I think this will probably get the job done. I was not all that impressed with the keyboard. I will say though that for a small key keyboard, these are kind of chiclet sized keys. It actually types okay because they are well spaced. So it is something that doesn't take too much getting used to, but it does feel like you're on a trampoline a bit. They are very springy keys. The entire keyboard here will flex as you type on it. This is not unique to this device. I've seen Surface devices that do the same thing because this keyboard case is so thin. It has a good size trackpad here. It tracks fairly well. Um, but it too is a bit springy. And one thing I noted when it was on my lap is that it would often click when I uh, push down or just put some weight uh, on the uh, keyboard deck here. It's pretty good at ignoring some of those accidental clicks, but you'll get them every once in a while if you put down a little bit of extra weight on this while it's on your lap. The keyboard also is not backlit. All right, let's take a look now and see how it performs. We'll begin with some web browsing. I did turn the display brightness down because it was blowing out my camera. Uh, so what we'll do here is load up a Chrome browsing session and head over to the nasa.gov homepage. And as you can see, everything renders in here fairly quickly. Now we are running on my Wi-Fi 6 network, so it does support Wi-Fi 6. So things seem to be coming in fairly quickly here. It doesn't seem to be any real lag or any other issues here doing the basics like browsing the web. Even some of these animations are looking pretty good here too. So from a web browsing side of things, I think uh, this will be a very good experience. And a little bit earlier, we ran some 1080p, 60 frames per second YouTube videos, and we were getting a couple of drop frames here and there, but more or less it was able to keep up with the high frame rate video. So I think if you're watching YouTube or Twitch or something where you'll see a lot of that 60 FPS content, this should be able to play it back just fine. And on the browserbench.org speedometer test, we got a score of 46. That is almost identical to the score we got on the HP Chromebook 14A that was running with an entry level Intel processor. And you can also see how this compares against some of the cheaper ARM-based Chromebooks running with the MediaTek chips.
All right, let's take a look now at its pen support. I've got an app up right now called Google Cursive, which is a pen app designed for Chrome tablets. And as I write on the screen here, the pen doesn't feel like it's got the same level of precision that I would find on a iPad or on a Windows device, for example. There's also a bit of latency as I'm writing. Additionally, there does not appear to be any pressure sensitivity as I am doing things with the paintbrush here, for example. So if I push down harder, the line isn't any darker. So that's something that, of course, the iPad can do and the Windows tablets can do as well. And I'm pretty sure this pen supports that pressure detection. So the pen side of this is not quite there. And I think that's more on Google than it is on HP at the moment. So we'll have to see if software developments warrant something to update you on in the future. But right now, it's just not a great pen experience, and I would not buy this for its pen capabilities. That said, they do have some cool pen input options here. So right now, of course, I'm on a website, Google, and I've got the text input form here pulled up. And if I click on this little squiggly line here, I can write instead of type. And for some people, that might be a faster way to get text input into a field versus having to tap it out on a keyboard. And then you can just erase it here and then write in something else. But I'm also noticing that same lack of precision using this text input field that I saw on Google Cursive. And I'm also still sensing some degree of latency on the pen. Uh, so all in, pen support on Chrome OS is not quite ready for prime time just yet. Now, most Chromebooks run Android apps, but on the Chromebooks without a touch screen, the experience can kind of be a hit or miss thing. This one being a tablet actually offers a slightly better Android experience. You can find your Android apps on the Google Play Store. This is the same Play Store that you run on your phone, so there's a good chance the apps you already own on your phone will install just fine on here. Uh, because this is an ARM-based Chromebook, I think you might see a little better compatibility on here versus an Intel Chromebook. A little bit earlier, we ran Call of Duty Mobile, which is a pretty involved first-person shooter on the Android platform. Ran just fine. It looked just fine. The performance felt about right. Just a little bit harder to control with the bigger screen, but overall it was a very good Android gaming experience with that game and a few other casual titles that we tried out. And on the 3D Mark Slingshot benchmark test, we got a score of 3,148. That is a very good score for an ARM-based Chromebook on this Android gaming benchmark test, but it is not as good as what you'll get out of a ninth generation iPad, which is of course the entry level iPad that when you fully deck it out with a Logitech keyboard and trackpad and an Apple Pencil will cost about what this one costs. So my recommendation here is that if you're looking to play games, this is probably not your device. It's not your device if you want to do a lot of pen-based applications. And if those two applications are the things you're looking to do the most, I think that iPad is the best way to go. But if you're looking for a Chrome OS device that is a tablet, this is probably a good choice because it performs very well and it's got a really nice display on board. Now, one more note on Android on Chrome OS, and that relates to watching Netflix and a few of the other popular streaming services on your device. If you load up the Android app for Netflix, for example, you will only get standard definition video, not HD. And remember, you've got a nice 2K display on this device, so the video looks pretty lousy when you're running the Android version of Netflix's app. And this relates to DRM, Digital Rights Management, and the level that this device supports. So to get technical for a second, this is still locked at Widevine L3, and you really want something that runs at L1. And because of this, you only get standard definition video out of the app. So if you want the best visual quality, skip the app, go to the web browser, and load up netflix.com directly to get the best image quality. Now, one last thing to look at on the tablet is its Linux performance. Let's have a look at that. Now, Linux on Chrome OS is getting better all the time, but you do have to know your way around the command line to get software installed. I installed GIMP and a few other apps a little bit earlier so we can take a look and see how they run. GIMP is a photo editor, an open source version of Photoshop, 
And it runs okay. It's a little on the sluggish side here on this ARM-based Chromebook. So you'll see the image here kind of loads in a little slow. But once you get it up and running here, you can uh, zoom around and navigate the image uh, fairly well. So not bad, but not terribly quick. I also loaded up LibreOffice, which is an open source version of Microsoft Office. So you get a nice spreadsheet, a word processor, and a few other apps here. Uh, this runs just fine. And what's nice about the Linux apps is that you can run them locally on your device without the need for an internet connection. So this app is running like any Windows app would on a Windows machine. You can turn the Wi-Fi off and have uh, full access to the app and all of its features. Again, everything's going to be a little more sluggish perhaps versus a mid-range Intel PC, but it does run these Linux apps and just about everything I installed is running just fine. Uh, one thing to note though is that on the Intel-based Chromebooks, you can install Steam and maybe get a few games running. Because this is ARM and not Intel, you can't get Steam games running with this at the time I'm shooting this video. So the Linux stuff will be limited to development work and some of these open source apps that I demoed here. Now every Chromebook comes with an end of support date. This one's date is June of 2029. After that date, this device will no longer receive software updates, but it will still operate. And that date is fixed. It is not based on when you bought it. So if you buy this thing five years from now, you've got two to two and a half years of support left on it before it ends. So just be aware of that when shopping for a Chromebook. So overall, this is a very nice Chrome OS device and easily the nicest Chrome tablet I have looked at. Unfortunately, Google's implementation of tablet functions on Chrome OS is not fully baked just yet. So if you are intending to use this for artwork or a lot of note taking, I would advise you to probably look at the entry level iPad that you can configure in a similar way for around the same price. Their pen functionality is just much better than what I've experienced with this device. So I would consider the pen kind of a secondary input option, not a primary one here. But for Chrome OS and all the things that you can do with Chrome OS, including Android apps and Linux, this is a very nice implementation. And if you're looking for a Chrome OS device that is in a tablet form factor, this is a relatively affordable and high quality way to go that also performs pretty nicely too. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Hot Sauce and Video Games, Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, Thomas Anfang, Jim Tannis and Handheld Obsession. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.